Do you love your job? I mean, really love it. Because as the old adage goes, if you find something you're truly passionate about, you'll never work a day in your life. Today, we're looking at two men, born centuries apart, who found their calling in putting others to death for their crimes. Enter Mr. Hajj Abd al-Nabi, Egypt's executioner. Strangling has been my hobby since childhood. I just love my job. The following are excerpts from an interview with al-Nabi, the official executioner of Egypt, which was posted on the internet in September 2013. I am the executioner of the Arab Republic of Egypt. I hold the rank of chief warrant officer in the police and the prison authority. I am Egypt's executioner, responsible for carrying out the death penalty. I love people, and people love me. But when I am doing my job, I am carrying out the law of Allah. When it comes to carrying out my job, I am tough. The murderer has done an abominable thing, and I cannot be soft with him. If I were soft towards this criminal, I wouldn't be able to execute him. But when I'm at home with my kids, I am as calm as can be. I have placed the noose around some 800 heads. Tough people, big people, young people. All the despicable crimes, killing, premeditated murder, adultery, and so on. I carry out the death sentences. In all honesty, I love my work. I just love it. I never say no when they need me at work. This is my work and my livelihood. When I was young, about 13 or 14 years old, the dry Ismailia Canal in Shubra al Khaima still had water in it. My hobby was to catch a cat, to place a rope around its neck, to strangle it and throw it into the water. I would get hold of any animal, even dogs. I would strangle these animals and throw them into the water, even dogs. That was a long time ago? Yes, when I was 13 or 14 years old. Strangulation was my hobby. When I applied for the job and did well on the tests, proving that I could take the psychological pressure and so on, they said, congratulations, now grow a moustache. The truth is that my heart is dead, because executing comes from the heart, not the moustache. Only if you have a heart of stone can you be content in this line of work. My parents were hard on me. They would say, this will get you to hell. And I would say to them, the cat bit me. The cat bit some kid. Or the dog bit a boy in the leg, and the leg got infected. I became the enemy of all things harmful to mankind. So you were violent as a boy? I was a little Satan. Did you strangle many kids you were playing with? Whenever I would place my hands around a child's neck, I would go soft when I remembered that it was a child, not an animal. So you had a disposition towards this job from a young age. It's a gift. Strangling is a gift, a great gift. I love my job very much and I can't give it up. Even when I retire, I will report for duty in emergencies. I will leave this job only when I am dead. Meet William Calcraft, the longest serving hangman in British history. There's no confirmed account of how many executions he conducted over his 45-year career, but it was somewhere between 430 and 450. At least 388 of those hangings took place in public, and about a further 41 are recorded as having been carried out in private. Some 34 of the total were women. Calcraft was born in Badau, near Chelmsford in Essex, on the 11th of October 1800. As a young man, he had a few casual jobs, including working as a night watchman for a brewery and also as a butler to a gentleman in Greenwich. But his real trade was that of a cobbler, a skill learned from his father. Upon his father's death, 
Calcraft took over the family business, which included a shop premises. The shop was no longer doing particularly well. Times were changing. Progress meant machines were being used more and more. Not having the capital to invest in such machinery meant the business was unable to compete until it was finally forced to close. Calcraft was actually quite relieved, as in his own words, he, quote, detested the drudgery. During the final months before the closure of the business, he'd started to sell meat pies in the streets around Newgate Prison to supplement his income. This was something he actually enjoyed, especially the meeting and chatting with people. One particular friendship he struck up was with a John Foxton, who happened to be the chief hangman at Newgate Prison. Calcraft asked Foxton if he knew of any job vacancies at the prison and was informed that there was one available a position that had been unfilled for a while due to the fact that most people found it of an unpalatable nature as it involved the flogging of juveniles. However, this certainly did not put Calcraft off. Again, in his own words, he, quote, undertook it with relish and earned a wage of 10 shillings a week for doing so. Crime amongst children increased sharply at the beginning of the 19th century due to a rise in urban poverty. People poured into the cities looking for work. The poverty rose and the slums established, causing more squalor. Many children suffered violence in the home. Crime was often a way of life. No schooling meant gangs of youngsters roamed the streets thieving and pickpocketing. Foxton died on the 14th of February, 1829, and Calcraft was to become chief executioner in his place. He was sworn in as executioner for the city of London and Middlesex on the 4th of April, 1829. However, his first official hangings took place before this date. On the 27th of March, he was called to an emergency case, the double execution of Thomas Lister and George Wingfield. Calcraft's wage at this time was set at a guinea a week, with a further guinea for every hanging and half a crown per flogging. He also had an allowance to purchase equipment, such as rope, and whips. It didn't take Calcraft much time to realise the longer a condemned prisoner took to die, the more the watching crowd enjoyed it. He began to make each execution a performance to entertain his audience. The gallows method in use when he first took over meant the condemned died typically in two or three minutes. But by reintroducing the short drop method, death could take between 10 and 20 minutes death by slow, agonizing strangulation. To add to the entertainment, Calcraft would sometimes swing from the prisoners' legs or even climb up onto their shoulders. Calcraft's first year as a chief executioner was a busy one. Assisted by Thomas Cheshire, he performed some 31 executions. He continued to be busy throughout his long career. So many hangings, the details of some stand out more than others. On April 20th, 1849, Calcraft publicly hanged 17-year-old Sarah Thomas in Bristol after she'd been convicted of the murder of her mistress, who had cruelly mistreated her. Calcraft was emotionally disturbed by this case due to her youth and good looks. Later that same year, on the 13th of November, a rare and unusual case was seen, the double execution of a husband and wife, Frederick and Maria Manning. For the murder of Maria's lover, Patrick O'Connor, for financial gain. They then buried him under the kitchen floor. The couple were hanged side by side on the rooftop of Horsemonger Lane Jail, Surrey's main prison and place of execution up until its closure in 1878. A crowd of approximately 50,000 turned out to watch the spectacle, among them one Charles Dickens. By the 1860s, Victorian society was beginning to find public executions distasteful. Public opinion was changing. At one time, all classes would attend a hanging, but the hordes of drunken, jeering onlookers were becoming less tolerable. Crime among the spectating crowds was a problem, with theft and pickpocketing rife. Policing the masses effectively was an impossible task. Instances of people being crushed by those wanting a better view were not unheard of, and then there was the danger that public executions would make martyrs of those condemned of crimes of a more political nature. 
During Calcraft's 45-year role as an executioner, there were times when his competence was called into question. Perhaps one of the lowest points of his career came around midway in 1856, with the bungled public hanging of William Boosfield. Opposition to the death penalty was beginning to cause unrest amongst certain groups. Calcraft himself became a target when he received a death threat before Boosfield's execution. A letter advised him to buy a helmet to wear whilst carrying out the hanging, as the intention was to shoot him. It appears that William Boosfield was a bit of a, quote, no-hoper. Weak and unable to hold down a permanent job, in an attempt to provide him with steady employment, Boosfield's father-in-law gave his daughter Sarah and her new husband a shop as a wedding gift, a way to provide them with regular income. However, it soon came to be that Sarah was doing all the work. With the pressure of her being the main breadwinner, money being tight and three small children to look after, it was inevitable that home life was going to become intolerably stressful. Exasperated, Sarah's father offered Boosfield money to leave the family for good by emigrating to America, something his son-in-law declined to do. On the night of the 3rd of February, 1856, matters came to a head. Boosfield stabbed his 28-year-old wife in the neck with a chisel at their home, 4 Portland Street, St. James, Westminster. He also stabbed his children to death, Anne, 6 years old, Eliza, 4 years old, and John William, just 8 months. It was some considerable time later, just after 7am the following day, that he walked into Bow Street Police Station and confessed to what he had done. It was PC Alfred Fudge who attended the scene and discovered the true horror of the crime. The walls were sprayed with blood. The bodies of Boosfield's family lay where he'd butchered them. Boosfield's trial was held at the Old Bailey on March the 6th, 1856, presided over by Mr Justice Whiteman. A plea of not guilty was entered on the grounds of insanity. However, the jury were not swayed and it took just a few minutes to return a guilty verdict. As the death sentence was passed, Boosfield nearly collapsed and had to be assisted from the dock. During the time in Newgate Prison leading up to his execution, which was set for Monday 31st of March, Boosfield portrayed a pathetic figure, claiming to have no recollection of the events of that terrible night, declaring it all a bad dream. On the Saturday prior to his execution, he attempted to take his own life in his cell by throwing himself onto the fire. His neckerchief caught light and as a result, his face and neck were severely burned. On the morning of the 31st, at 8.30am, Sheriffs Kennedy and Rose, along with the undersheriffs, arrived at the prison. At 7.45, accompanied by the Governor and Reverend Davis, they went to the condemned cell. Boosfield was sitting in a chair, being supported by a prison officer at either side. Calcraft arrived a few minutes before 8am and pinioned the prisoner's arms. It soon became obvious that Boosfield was unable to stand. The only option was for him to be carried. So one man took his legs, another lifted him under the armpits and he was dragged off, his burns swathed in bandages, to the gallows, where some 5,000 had gathered to watch the execution. However, upon reaching the steps of the scaffold, another problem arose, how to get him up there. It was at this point that a high-backed chair was fetched from the governor's office. Boosfield was restrained upon it, and then four prison officers carried him up and placed the chair onto the trap door. Throughout the whole proceedings, Calcraft appeared nervous and on edge, no doubt worried due to the death threat he'd received earlier. As soon as the chair was in place, he quickly placed the cap onto the prisoner's head, adjusted the noose, secured the rope to the chain, and without giving any warning or signal, ran down the steps of the scaffold releasing the bolt of the trapdoor on his way. The chair dropped through the hole, but as it did so, Boosfield, who had been unable to even stand up to this point, suddenly found the strength to throw his arms and legs wide and managed to find a position to stop himself from falling through. Prison officers climbed back onto the scaffold and attempted to push the man's legs down. Meanwhile, while all this was going on, Calcraft was still running away insisting that Boosfield was already dead. Somehow the prisoner managed to maintain his position. All the while the crowd was jeering and yelling. The sheriffs and officials were horrified 
as to what they were witnessing. It was Reverend Davis who finally managed to locate and persuade Calcraft to return and finish the job, which he obliged in doing by going underneath the scaffold and pulling on Boosfield's legs, only for once again the prisoner to succeed in getting a foothold on the edge of the trapdoor opening. Finally, after a fourth attempt, they managed to successfully get Boosfield's legs down. In a severe struggle, lasting for nearly ten minutes, Boosfield eventually died. Calcraft retired in 1874 on a pension of 25 shillings per week from the City of London. Towards the end of his life, he questioned himself as to whether he was, quote, truly a bad lot. Although he brought pain and suffering to those about to die at his hands, he justified it by the entertainment he'd brought to others, who, in his opinion, had little joy or pleasure in their own lives. Calcraft died five years after his retirement, in December 1879. His final resting place is now in an overgrown cemetery in North London. So, there you have it. Two men, born approximately 150 years apart, on different continents, who ended up doing the same job. Whilst al Nabi maintains it was his calling, and has carried out his duty with honour, and it could be argued a certain amount of relish, Calcraft sort of fell into his career, and by all accounts ended up in a sort of love-hate relationship with it. Do you think executioners are all alike? Are there any essential character traits one should possess in order to be a successful executioner? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for watching and see you next time.